Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. As someone who churns out tens of thousands of words every week, everything from emails and blog posts to business documents and these radio scripts, I've developed a fascination with words and, for whatever reason, names, especially the origins of names. The study of word origins is etymology, and the study of name origins is onomastics. Let's engage in a little onomastics right here. Let's look at the name Ignatius. This is an ancient name, dating back to the Etruscans, the civilization before the Romans. A lot of dudes named Ignatius over the centuries. When the Spanish came along, Ignatius morphed into Ignatio, which was often abbreviated to just Nacho. Now, fast forward to 1943. Ignacio Anaya lived in a place called Piedras Negras, which is just over the border from Eagle Pass, Texas, which was the home to a U.S. military base. One night, some American soldiers came to his restaurant looking for something to eat. With almost nothing in the kitchen, he whipped up something featuring deep-fried tortillas, cut into triangles, covered in cheese, and served with pickled jalapeno peppers. The soldiers loved this improvised snack so much that they named it after their host, Ignacio Nacho Anaya. That's why we call them nachos. But there's another part to the Ignatius story. Back over in Europe, in Bavaria, Ignatius transformed into Ignats. The short form for that was Nazi. And that's how Nazi came to denote a backwards peasant from the Bavarian countryside. The same part of Germany also gave rise to a political party called National Socialismus, led by a guy named Adolf Hitler. Those who thought Hitler was a clown abbreviated National Socialismus to Nazi as a way of calling the party a bunch of boobs. It was a taunt. It was an insult. But Hitler and his crew turned everything around and took the term Nazi as their own. And, well, things turned out badly for the planet. But isn't that kind of cool? There's this, this connection between something as diverse as a bunch of wacko German fascists and a plate of junk food that's great for hangovers. What if we apply this sort of scholarly and onomastical research to the names of musical groups? Let's do that. Hang on. A lot of data is about to come your way. This is the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross. When I first started doing this years ago, I realized that there wasn't a word that denoted the study of the origins of band names. Like I said, we have etymology and onomastics, but neither is specific enough. So I consulted a series of linguistic experts from Toronto to San Francisco, and the word they came up with is bandimonology. It's not in the Oxford English Dictionary yet, but I am hopeful. The perfect band name has to fulfill a number of important criteria. First of all, it must say something about the image that you want to project to the world. It should be memorable. It has to be at least somewhat congruent with your sound. Everybody in the band has to like it or at least be willing to tolerate it. It's got to be unique. You can't use a name that's already been taken. And it has to lend itself to good graphic design. Now, I cannot name your group, but what we can do is study how other bands came up with their names. And we're going to go through the origins of 60 band names in the next 60 minutes. And again, we're officially engaging in something that we have called bandimonology. Learn the word, use the word, spread the word, love the word. Bandimonology. All right, let's start with 30 Seconds to Mars. Jared and Shannon Lato grabbed the name from a subsection of a thesis published online by a Harvard professor about technological progress. What he was trying to say was that things are advancing so fast that on an evolutionary scale, humans are this close to making it to Mars. Jared and Shannon thought that such a grand thought described perfectly what they wanted to do with their band name, so they copped the name 30 Seconds to Mars. Alexis on Fire. Okay, we have to credit Alexis Fire, the world's only lactating contortionist stripper. She's a real person who tried to sue the band for copyright infringement, but since she never registered the name, nothing ever came of that. Arcade Fire. Singer Wynne Butler insists that the band's name is based on a story somebody told him about a fire in an arcade. It was more of a threat, really. When he was 12, he was beaten up by some high school kid who kept talking about this place that burned down. An arcade. 
that killed a bunch of kids in the process. Arctic Monkeys. The band hates that name, but that's what happens when you don't give things much thought. Guitarist Jamie Cook came up with it, but has never explained where it came from, although some have suggested he saw a picture of some Japanese snow monkeys sitting in a hot spring during the winter. Billy Talent. Well, if you've ever seen the Canadian rock and roll film Hardcore Logo, you know this story. There's a character in the film called Billy Talent, with talent spelled with two L's, played by Callum Keith Rennie, who later went on to have roles in Battlestar Galactica and Californication. Broken Social Scene. While on tour with a friend's band... Kevin Drew had this crazy keyboard setup, which he likened to John Tesh, the soft music king. When he got back to Toronto, he played a jokey gig under John Tesh Jr. and the Broken Social Scene. The last half of that name stuck for his next project. And then we have Cage the Elephant. This is a mystery. The band keeps coming up with different stories. A mentally deranged man who kept yelling, you've got to cage the elephant at them. A fortune teller who turned over a card on singer Matt Schultz and started yelling, Cage the Elephant. There's a bunch of others, but the band is coy. They've been known to say, we'll never tell. All right, then. Let's continue with 60 band name origins in these 60 minutes that we have together. City in color, which is terribly obvious, yet not. Dallas Green. Get it? Coldplay. They used to be called Starfish in university, but they all hated that name. There was another group at Oxford called Coldplay who had taken their name from a collection of poems entitled Children's Reflections. Coldplay. Two words, by the way. That other band were in the process of going defunct, so Starfish asked them if they could have their name, and they said, okay. Death Cab for Cutie. Now, for this, we have to go back to 1967 for a British band called the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. They recorded an album entitled Gorilla, which featured a song called Death Cab for Cutie. And that, in turn, was based on a tabloid headline for a story about a woman who was killed in an accident involving a taxi. Foo Fighters. Here's another regret. Dave Grohl thinks that's a stupid name for a band. But the bandimanology is fascinating. In the skies over Europe in World War II, pilots on both sides reported seeing mysterious balls of fire that moved with astonishing speed. No one knew what they were, and no one could ever catch them. Feu, F-E-U, is French for fire, and those pilots scrambled to check out these balls of fire were called feu fighters, or foo fighters. Nice, nice UFO connection. Foster the People. This group was supposed to be called Foster and the People after singer Mark Foster, but people kept missing the and whenever he introduced the group and heard the name as Foster the People. So it it stuck. Kings of Leon. The band consists of three brothers and a cousin, and they are all related to Leon Followell, who is the grandfather of Caleb, Nathan, and Jared, and the great uncle of Matthew. They wanted to pay tribute to him by carrying on his name. Lincoln Park. This was not the original name of the band. They were called Zero, with an X, and then Hybrid Theory, but then there were problems with other groups using those names. It was Chester Bennington who came up with the new name after driving past a Lincoln Park in Santa Monica, California. The change in spelling was the result of the band wanting to secure the domain LincolnPark.com. By the way, don't go looking for that park in Santa Monica because it's been renamed Christine Emerson Reed Park. And one more, Nine Inch Nails. Although it sounds like there should be a great story behind it, there isn't. Trent Reznor was always doodling when it came to band names. His rule was that after two weeks, if he still liked the name, he would keep it. And out of all the names he considered for his band, Nine Inch Nails was the only one that made the cut. We have gone through 15 of the 60 band name origins promised for this show. Number 16 is Pearl Jam. There is a very elaborate story about how Eddie Vedder had a grandmother named Pearl who used to make a special spread for her husband that had peyote as a major ingredient. Started his day with a nice buzz. Great story. Not true. Eddie has confessed that he made that all up. The group used to be called Mookie Blaylock after the New Jersey Nets point guard, 
But when lawyers started making noises about that, they had to make a change. They liked the word Pearl, but it wasn't until they saw Neil Young jam at a concert in New Jersey that they put the two together. Hence, Pearl Jam. Queens of the Stone Age. You can credit Chris Goss, a member of a band called Masters of Reality. He produced records for Caius, the band that came just before Queens. As the group was working through some material, he suggested that instead of Kings of the Stone Age, which was a name under consideration, the group go with Queens of the Stone Age, implying that they were heavy enough for boys and sweet enough for the girls, which seems to have worked. Soundgarden, that's easy. There's a sculpture erected by artist Doug Hollis on the grounds of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Seattle. When the wind blows, the sculpture makes some cool, sinister noises. And the name of the sculpture? Soundgarden. All right, some 41, some competing stories here. Number one, the band formed 41 days into the summer of 1996, which would have been September the 28th. That doesn't work because summer is actually over by September the 28th. Number two, if you take a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter and add up all the values, you have a sum of 41 cents. Very Kabbalistic. Number three, if you look at a computer keyboard, the shift of four is the dollar sign, and for one, it's the exclamation mark. Therefore, we have dollar sign, exclamation mark, or the expression of a wish to get rich. So, take your pick. And name number 20, Tragically Hip. Back in 1981, Michael Nesmith, one of the guys from the Monkees, remember that band from the 60s, released a VHS tape filled with weird skits called Elephant Parts. One of the sketches was called The Tragically Hip. And there's a line that goes something like, send money to the foundation for the tragically hip. Then Gord Downey heard the phrase in an Elvis Costello song called Town Crier from his 1982 album Imperial Bedroom. And so the two references to the phrase seemed to be like some kind of sign. So there it was. We are one-third our way through a list of 60 band names in 60 minutes. And coming up next, we'll start all over again at A and work through another 20. Hang on. You're listening to the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. This is an exercise in bandiminology, which is the word we've created to describe the study of the origins of band names. We're going through 60 names in this program, and we'll pick up at number 21, which is Alice in Chains. It was originally spelled Alice in Chains, like Guns N' Roses. That was singer Lane Staley's previous band. Alice in Chains was supposed to be a jokey side project where the members were going to dress up and drag and play metal. But then it kind of backfired and became their real name. The whole idea came out of a stoned and drunken conversation at a party about the Lewis Carroll book Alice in Wonderland, which led to Alice in Chains. But because some of the parents of these musicians were unhappy with that name, I mean, Lane's mom was especially upset with the connection, they went with Alice in Chains. But when they broke up, Lane disobeyed his mom and went with Alice in Chains. Got that? Blur. They were called Seymour when they signed their record deal, but their label hated that name. So they were presented with a series of new names, told to pick one, and the one they picked was Blur. The Clash. Simple, newspaper headline. When they were looking for a name, they noticed a story in the Daily Telegraph that talked about a clash with police. Depeche Mode, that also has its roots in print. It's the name of a French fashion magazine. It translates as fast fashion. Green Day, that's all about a day smoking weed. A green day. It started as an early, early, early Billy Joe Armstrong song that was played when the group was still known as Sweet Children. And number 26 on our list is Jane's Addiction. There really was a woman named Jane, and she did have addictions. Her name was Jane Bainter, Perry Farrell's roommate back in a shared house on North Wilton Place in Los Angeles in the 1980s. When things went wrong at the house, which they often did because of all the parties and drugs and alcohol, the trouble was always blamed on Jane's addiction. If you want to learn more about Jane, all you got to do is listen to the song Jane Says. She had a smack habit. She had a boyfriend dealer named Sergio, and she dreamed about going to Spain. And get this, the Jane's Addiction logo is actually done in Jane Bainter's handwriting. So you might want to ask, how much did Jane get from the band for all her contributions? 
Uh, nothing. Zero. Moving on with more band names. Jimmy Eat World. Conspiracy theorists make much of the fact that their name can be abbreviated J-E-W, but really nothing to do with Zionists. It's much, much more innocent than that. Guitarist Tom Linton had two little brothers, Jim and Ed. They fought all the time, and after one epic battle, Ed drew a picture of Jim shoving a picture of the earth into his mouth, and the caption of the crayon drawing was, Jimmy Eat World. Oasis, not a chain store, as some claim, but a Manchester music venue called the Oasis Leisure Center. The Inspiral Carpets often played there, and Noel Gallagher was once their drum roadie. R.E.M. The band was under pressure to come up with a name before their first ever gig at a church in Athens, Georgia. Singer Michael Stipe just randomly pulled it out of a dictionary. In the real world, R.E.M. stands for Rapid Eye Movement and is related to what happens when we dream. But in the case of the band... R-E-M doesn't stand for anything at all. Sex Pistols. People forget that they were essentially a manufactured boy band. An edgy punk boy band, but a boy band just the same. They were put together by manager Malcolm McLaren, who ran a bondage clothing store in London called Sex. He also liked the word pistols, which he thought sounded dangerous. So, Sex Pistols, it was. Basically, a living, breathing advertisement for his store. And number 33 on our list is Stone Temple Pilots. Their name was actually reverse-engineered from some initials. As they were getting together, they went by the name Mighty Joe Young, but that was a problem. Now, the band thought that they were paying tribute to a 1949 giant gorilla movie, but a blues musician already had beat them to it. So, to avoid legal problems, they had to change their name from Mighty Joe Young. There was a little beer-drinking shrine in the backyard where the band often hung out, and it had been decorated with an STP oil treatment sticker. The group took the initials and tried to make them stand for something instead of scientifically treated petroleum, which is what STP stands for. They went through a bunch of possibilities, including stinky toilet paper and a couple of rather obscene ones, but they ended up with Stone Temple Pilots. And as a nice touch, STP is also slang for a hallucinogenic drug called 2.5 dimethyl 4 methylamphetamine. We are engaging in bandimanology, the study of the origins of band names. The Killers. That was the name of a fictional band in the video for our New Order song called Crystal. You can see it on the bass drum in the clip. The Stooges. Iggy Pop was named Iggy because he once played drums in a band called the Iguanas. And then the pop part came when he shaved off his eyebrows and somebody pointed out that he looked like a local drug dealer named Jim Pop. So Iggy Pop it was. Stooges came from the Three Stooges the old slapstick group. 21 Pilots. Singer Tyler Joseph was in film class, studying the Arthur Miller play All My Sons, which was set during World War II. The story revolves around a guy who discovers that some plane parts are defective, but lets the planes using those parts go on missions anyway, which results in the death of 21 Pilots. Okay, that's great, but I've never found a reason why there is no hyphen in the band name 21 Pilots, and that frankly annoys me. U2. This was the idea of Steve Avril, a guy from a Dublin band called Radiators from Space. He was working at an ad agency. Bass player Adam Clayton called him up one day and asked him about renaming his new band from The Hype. Abbreviation names were hot at the time. Think uh, XTC, for example. So Dave included U2 on a list of 10 possibilities. The band ended up choosing that name, and Steve is now working as U2's art director. Velvet Underground. Lou Reed found a trashy paperback novel about sadomasochism in a New York gutter called The Velvet Underground. That was the best thing that ever happened to author Michael Lee. Weezer. Rivers Cuomo had bad asthma as a kid, so his friends called him Weezer. And this is band name number 40, The White Stripes. When Jack met Meg, he immediately noticed that she really, really liked red and white peppermint candies. The original idea was to call their new band The Peppermints, but since their last name was White, they went with the White Stripes. 
sort of a double meaning, you know? We have covered 40 of the 60 band name origins promised in this show. The final 20 are coming up next. Now, back to the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. The title of the show is 60 Band Name Origins in 60 Minutes, and we are up to number 41, which is Airborne Toxic Event. This was taken from a 1985 novel by Don DeLeo called White Noise. Blink-182. All right, this is another name where there's been plenty of misinformation. We know that the group was originally called Blink, but then they ran into an issue with an Irish band who had dibs on it. So rather than change it entirely, they added the 182 suffix, which is allegedly the number of times Al Pacino drops the F-bomb in the movie Scarface. It's a great story, but apparently it's not true. Another suggestion is that they were riffing off a 1985 movie called Turk 182, could 182 pounds be what Mark Hoppus thinks his ideal weight should be? Or maybe it's just a totally random number. That's the current explanation. Joy Division. This is another reference to a novel, which is called House of Dolls, a 1955 book by Yehiel de Noor, which told the story of a section of a Nazi concentration camp where female prisoners were used as sex slaves for Nazi officers on leave. That section was known as the Joy Division. The New York Dolls stole the name of the New York Doll Hospital, a place that actually repaired dolls. Pogues, that's short for the Gaelic phrase Pogue Mahone, which translates as kiss my ass. And the Ramones is an obscure reference to the Beatles. When the Beatles were touring, Paul McCartney would often sign into hotels as Paul Ramone, and that was good enough for the Ramones. Number 47 on our list of 60 band names in 60 minutes is Sloan. They had a friend named Jason. Jason had a French-speaking boss who didn't think that Jason was very bright, so he referred to Jason as a slow one. But because of his accent, that came out as Sloan, which, of course, became Jason's nickname. When the band asked if they could use that as their name, he said, okay, but I have to be on the cover of your first release. So if you have a copy of Sloan's Peppermint EP, that's a picture of Jason on the front. Staying in Canada, Metric used to be called Mainstream, but after one EP, they changed it to Metric after a preset on one of Jimmy's keyboards. Modest Mouse is another literary reference. It's a passage in a story called The Mark on the Wall by Virginia Woolf that reads, and very frequent in the minds of modest mouse-colored people. One more. This is number 50. Bastille had a really hard time coming up with a name until somebody pointed out that singer Dan Smith's birthday is July the 14th. That's Bastille Day in France. But if you close your eyes, does it almost feel like nothing changed at all? And if you close your eyes, does it almost feel like you've been here before? How I'm going to be an optimist about Ten more names to go with our bandomological study. Let's burn through them. Alt J, that's a little tricky. Their actual name, if you really want to get pedantic about it, is Delta, the Greek letter that looks like a triangle. But if you want to type that symbol on a Mac, the keyboard shortcut is, yes, Alt-J. The Black Keys may have come from Patrick Carney's dad, who called him and bandmate Dan Orbach a couple of Black Keys, meaning that they were a little weird, a little off. Another story says that it comes from a homeless schizophrenic man who would ask people for crayons and Diet Coke, and he would always say goodbye by saying, don't be a black key, be a B-flat. Daft Punk used to record under the name Darlin, but then they received a bad review in Melody Maker, the UK weekly music paper. They were described as, quote, Daft Punky Thrash. Okay, after that, they killed Darlin and went with Daft Punk, which you have to admit is a much better name. This is a nice segue to Phoenix, the French band. They're named after a song on Daft Punk's homework album. Or maybe it could be one of the guys in the band was born with a cleft palate that required surgery and left a scar, just like actor Joaquin Phoenix. That's a bit of a stretch, but 
All right, fine. Fallout Boy. Remember that Simpsons episode? The one with Radioactive Man's sidekick? Imagine Dragons. This one's actually tricky. It's, it's an anagram, apparently. But the band has refused to say what words were scrambled in the process to form Imagine Dragons. The only clue that they've dropped is that some apostrophes are required. Maybe. They've since backpedaled on that one. But wait, they're not off the hook here. Using an online anagram generator, we know that there are about 107,000 different combinations for the letters in Imagine Dragons. Guesses include adoring images, a roaming design, God is in the manger, and Radio Man Eggsin. The band continues to entertain guesses, but uh, they're still not saying. My Chemical Romance, that's another literary reference. Irving Welsh, the guy who wrote Train Spotting, also has a book called Five Tales of Chemical Romance. The my was added as a homage to the Irish band My Bloody Valentine, which, by the way, is derived from the title of a 1981 Canadian slasher film. That's a bonus for this list. Still with Literature, Of Mice and Men is the title of a John Steinbeck novel from 1937. How about Vampire Weekend? Band member Ezra Koenig was behind the camera for an ultra-low-budget horror film more than two years before the band was formed. It was called Vampire Weekend. And that leads us into our final band name, White Zombie. Headman Rob Zombie, whose real name is Rob Cummings, by the way, has a thing for horror movies. And one of his favorite was a 1932 Bela Lugosi movie called White Zombie. In a moment. More of the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Those were 60 stories behind 60 band names in just 60 minutes. Obviously, we could go on and on. So, depending on the reaction to this program, and please let me know what you think, we may have to do this again. I know there was a lot to take in, especially if you're in a band looking for tips and tricks when it comes to finding a name, which is why you should get the podcast, which you can study again and again. Look to iTunes or wherever you get your on-demand audio and you can find it. And if there's a name that you feel needs an explanation and wasn't on this program, just let me know through alan at alancross.ca. Otherwise, you can find me on my website seven days a week. It's ajournalofmusicalthings.com. It's updated all the time. And there's a very helpful newsletter that comes out by 10 a.m. Eastern every single day. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Google+. We really should connect. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast at iTunes and through Google Play. 